okay, this book stands out like no other book in the world. It's more copies of it are sold every year, year by year by year. It stands out like the white elephant in the room. Um, so we need to pay attention to, to the Bible. You know, it's, it's very obvious that this is a book that we need, we need to, uh, to investigate. You know, I remember Josh McDowell, he was a avowed atheist, and, and he uh, said, well, I'm just going to set out to prove that the Bible is wrong. And he went and did some hard investigation. He found out that everything in the Bible that he could find that he could prove actually was true, and he became a believer. So we need to uh, investigate the Bible for ourselves to see if it's true or not. We, we owe it to the eternal destiny of our soul. Um, now the Bible's author in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So our salvation is so great that if we don't investigate, we're only, we're only harming ourselves. Okay, ever since creation and man's rebellion against God, man's been trying to push himself away from God. He's, he's in rebellion against God. He doesn't want to answer to the Creator um, because man is, is a sinful creature. Uh, when, when he's born, he has a sin nature. And so he's at enmity with God. He doesn't want fellowship with God. So in talking about evolution here, um, it's no wonder that we search for answers uh, that don't involve God, that they explain God away, and then we're free to do our own thing and not be accountable. Um, that's not going to that's not going to work. Ignorance is not an excuse. God didn't create us as robots. He created us with the ability to choose what we do, what we think, what we say, to make good decisions, to make bad decisions. So. Um, we're not we're not robots. He doesn't he doesn't he didn't create us to just do exactly what what you know he programmed us to do. We have a choice in the matter. So I'm going to start with some problems with um, evolution. And uh, you know I encourage you to investigate these. Don't take my word for it. Um, go out and and uh, search the internet. See what you can find. <clears throat> Actually, before Darwin, there were uh, several uh, folks before him that kind of paved the way for Darwin when he made his famous trip down to the Galapagos Islands and studied the finches. That's another story. Um, but he eventually came up with his theory of evolution, which uh, involves uh, a theory of the survival of the fittest, that somehow we evolved from this pond scum and and uh, eventually uh, became single-celled creatures and um, worms, whatever, and, and uh, on and on, and, and became, became man. Um, so the way I've, in, in my research over the years, you know, I don't even regard the theory of evolution as a valid theory because you have to have uh, facts and evidence to support your side that that's pretty strong. You know, I look at it more of a, a at more of it as a hypothesis or a pre-theory. Okay, the first problem with evolution is that it's postulated that the universe just came into being somehow by itself. Now this goes against the first two laws of thermodynamics that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transformed into matter and vice versa, but somehow uh, the, energy, the universe exploded into being, and uh, you know how, how could that happen? Um, where did this energy or matter come from? From nothing? Doesn't make sense. Second law of thermodynamics is uh, the law of entropy, which says that all things uh, decay uh, over time and process. They do not increase in organization or complexity, but they, they tend to fall apart. And we can see that happening every day around us. You know, things rust, things break, things fall apart. Things require maintenance for them to work. Um, even in, in the human genome, we see that our genetic capabilities, our genetic uh, potential is slowly eroding over time. We're becoming more susceptible to, to genetic uh, problems 
as, as a human race. Okay, evolution also uh, runs into conflict with um, the law of logic, second law of logic, which is the law of non-contradiction, which th says that something cannot be both be and not be at the same time, in the same place, in the same way. So how can something, a universe, come out of being from nothing? You know, how can something that's here all of a sudden become here from nothing in the same time, in the same way, in the same place? It, it's a total violation of, of the law of non-contradiction and logic. So we've already violated three main uh, laws here and, and uh, hitching our wagon to evolution. Um, <clears throat> evolution states that there's a tree of life. Um, you see on the slide there, you, have, you would have your pond scum at the bottom and, and single cells. And By the way, a single cell creature is actually uh, as complex or more complex than a, a modern city with various you know, micro machines making micro machines and DNA uh, folding proteins and amino acids and doing just incredible things that, that Darwin had no idea was happening. He didn't have a powerful microscope back then to see, see what was going on. So evolution is represented by this tree with all, all the branches coming out with the different life forms, plants and animals, in contrast to creation where God created an orchard where each uh, individual creation was after its own kind. So an apple tree would, ha would leave an apple seed and that would grow an apple tree. It wouldn't become a peach tree. Um, in John 1.3, Jesus states, that all, or the Bible states, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And other verses support this statement as well, such as Colossians 1.16, <clears throat> which says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. So we have a creator then that we need to uh, honor and reconnect to. Um, evolution doesn't, doesn't provide that with us. And what's the end of evolution? You know, we, we, come from, we come from dust, we return to dust. What's the point of life? It's futile. When you have a savior, when you can reconnect with the creator, you know, life is wonderful. Life is fantastic. Life has an, an end point, a goal, and, and a future. And it's, you know, it's just fantastic. God created creatures to, to recreate after their kind. Um, a butterfly will never become a, a moth. A, a fruit fly can never become a house fly. You can change the chromosomes on a fruit fly all you want. It'll never be a house fly. It's a, it's a world apart. You look at the transitional, so-called transitional life forms, you know, the fossil record should be filled with, with various creatures changing into other creatures, but we don't see that. I'm going to get into a little bit of that later, too. When we do real science, science we use a scientific method, and so what we're doing is we're, we're doing things that are observable and things um, that are repeatable. Now, evolutionists and creationists, we have the same world to deal with. We can't go back in time 6,000 years and repeat and see what's observable because we, you know, we just can't go back in time. We don't have a, a time machine and we can't go back there and repeat and observe what was going on back then. So we have to deal with the present. What do we find in the present that supports our, our viewpoints? And we all have a world view. We all, have, we all come to the table with a bias. And, you know, I'm no exception. I, I have a bias, you know, especially since I've, since I've become saved. And I know what Jesus has done for me in my life, and I can't deny that. Um, and my bias, you know, my problem was to search for, well, if I believe in evolution, then 
I can't believe in the Bible either. Those two are at odds. Um, so I had to do some research in that area, and everyone should do the research in the area to resolve that in their own mind. Um, but evolutionists come to the table with a bias, and uh, it, it shows, and, and my bias shows, and that's just the way we are. You know, we, we believe what we believe, and we're hard to, to get off of that. Um, you know, a man to, uh, convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You know, we, it's hard to, to get around that, but we really need to investigate it. You know, our eternal souls are at stake. So the universe, uh, scientists think the universe is 19 billion years old. Um, how do I deal with that? that? Well, there are 11 uh, Bible references in the Old Testament that speak of God stretching out the heavens. So... What does that mean, stretching out the heavens? What does it mean? Well, to me, this is my interpretation on that, so take it with a grain of salt. But I believe that uh, the speed of light was quite a bit faster in the past. There's some evidence to support that. You can look up Barry Setterfield, the speed of light in the age of the universe. It's uh, back in the 80s he did the research. He took various measurements for the speed of light and the error bars associated with each type of, of measurement and fit that curve and came up with the speed of light was basically infinite in the not too distant past. So this, when God spread things out, it's like a paper fan. And when we're on the scene, it looks like everything's really old. Yeah, the light is traveling at, you know, 186,000 miles a second. And we have these CFID variable stars in, the, in uh, Andromeda, our closest galaxy, and we can see you know, how far we're away from Andromeda Galaxy, you know, 9 million light years. And so that's 9 million years right there. And so these other galaxies are a lot farther away. But if God, God stretched out the universe in a rapid fashion, it can, it can make it look really old when in fact it isn't. And that's what I believe. I believe it's like another analogy would be like if you took a drop of oil and dropped it into a big tank of water maybe 10 feet across, that drop of oil will spread out re relatively fast. But if you came along and a, a few minutes later, you'd say, boy, that, that oil's been there for a while. Look, it's spread all over, all over the, the tank of water. Um, and it, it'll spread out fast at first, and then it'll slow down. And that's what I think happened. And it's interesting the words used that God stretched out the heavens. He spread out the heavens. Think about that word. So let's not put God into a box. You know, you're always going to be putting him into a, a little bit bigger box, a little bit bigger box. You know, he's infinite. You know, we, we, he's, we're, he, he's quite beyond our frail, you know, mental limitations of what he can do. He's, he's just amazing, awesome, and, and infinite. And we can't put him in a box and say, you know, he's, he's not capable of doing this, that, or the other, because he, he is. <laughs> he really is. Okay, now another thing in our, in our solar system that shows, uh, indicates that we're, the solar system is relatively young is these things called short period comets. These comets that travel around the sun that have a short period of, say, around 200 years, these should have long since been swept up by the sun or by the large gaseous planets through gravitational interactions. And scientists estimate that certainly within 11 million years, these, all these short period comets should be gone. Now the, the evolutionists counter that periodically our solar system travels through space and goes through this Oort cloud, which is uh, a cloud that's postulated to exist somewhere that we, we intersect with at points, um, but it's never, its existence has never been proven. So this is another, another reason that we suspect that the solar system is very young, the existence of these short period comets. There's another phenomenon called Pointing-Robertson effect by a guy named Pointing and another guy named Robertson. And they theorize that particles smaller than 10 mic micrometers, uh, 10 millionths of an inch, will be pushed away by the sun's um, solar wind. Uh, the, the solar wind is particles traveling at near light speeds, relativistic speeds and, and uh, light. They would push these particles back in contrast to the larger particles, which would be gravitationally attracted towards the sun, so that these particles over eons of time would sort themselves according to size.
But we don't find that. Spacecraft have gone out and they see there's no sorting of particles according to size. It's, it's hom homogeneously distributed wherever, wherever they search for these particles. Okay, some other problems with the old solar system model include lunar recession. The moon, uh, NASA has stated, uh, recedes or travels away from the Earth about 1.5 inches per year. So if you do that for 4.5 billion years, uh, actually only about 1.5 billion years, the moon will be touching the Earth. And actually, its rate of, of, of recession is slowing down, so it would have been faster in the past that the moon was, you know, a, had approached the Earth. Um, so there's a big problem there that hasn't been explained. Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, these large gaseous outer planets, they emit uh, more radiation than they receive from the sun. Now, no matter what explanation you use, if, if they are 4.5 billion years old, they should be not emitting hardly any heat at all. So that's another problem. So let's go to evidences for a young Earth. And probably the main uh, tool that's used by evolutionists is radioactive dating. So we have all these radioactive materials and they decay and the, the most famous one is the uranium uh, to lead decay uh, process. And uh, actually it's uranium-235, not 238, that's, that's the radioactive element, uh, the radioactive isotope. You normally think it's the heavier one that would be unstable, but in this case it's actually 235. But it goes through a decay process chain where it decays uh, to various elements and, and subatomic particles are, are thrown off. But at any rate, after 700 million years, the uranium becomes lead. So we use this... Uh, it's been used to, to radioactively date rock in the fossil strata, the Cretaceous rock, the rock that contains cre creatures, to date these layers at you know hundreds of millions of years old. So what's the problem with radioactive dating? Well, you have to make three major assumptions, each each of which uh, has some problems with it. Um, first, you have to assume that the the uh, rate of decay has been the same through time. So if the speed of light was much faster in the past, guess what? The radioactive decay rate would be much faster in the past, making something look you know, artificially much older than what it really is. Um, another problem is that it, it is assumed that there's no daughter material present in the sample. So Who's to say there wasn't some lead present in the original sample? But let's assume that it all started out with uranium, if uranium is used in, in the case. They use other radioactive materials like polonium and, and so forth. Um, but if there was uranium present in the sample, that would make the sample look really old. So that's a big problem, assuming that there's no, no uh, daughter material present uh, in the sample to begin with. Now, the third one is actually a, a pretty substantial problem, probably maybe one of the biggest problems. You have to assume that the sample <clears throat> was never underwater because uranium salts are more soluble in water than lead. So uh, one famous case, there was a, a volcano that went up in, uh, I'll try to pronounce this, Kapolilu Lahu um, in Hawaii, and this is volcanic lava rock that has formed, uh, you know, brand new rock. So it's brand new rock. They took two samples. One was dated at 140 million to 160 million years old, and the other sample is dated at 3 billion years old. And this lava was formed in the year 1800. You see a problem here? First of all, these two numbers do not, are not in agreement. And second, the, the sample was underwater, which leached out the uranium salts, leaving a lot of lead, leave, leaving the sample to look very old. So radioactive uh, dating has, has some serious problems. We'll talk about carbon-14 a little bit later, too. So on the Earth, uh, when we look at the, the, uh, the fossil, uh, fossil beds and different parts of the Earth, 
they found in, they found in several places what they call polystrate fossils. <clears throat> and this is a really big problem for evolutionists because as you can see here, this tree trunk that's fossilized is cutting through, you know, arguably uh, from an evolutionist standpoint, millions of, possibly millions of years of strata of Cretaceous rock that contains other fossilized creatures. And yet, it, this fossil is obviously implanted at, you know, at the same time as all these other layers were made. You know, this, these were all done at the same time. These layers were formed at the same time. And you have that uh, evidence uh, in 1980 at Mount St. Helens. So you have all these layers that were formed. You know, Mount St. Helens is a 140th scale of the Grand Canyon. And these layers uh, at Mount St. Helens formed over periods of days, weeks, and months, not millions of years. So that's kind of a big problem. Now, at Mount St. Helens, they have these same type of tree um, formations that could potentially become like this in the future. Most of the trees that were blown away by the volcano were deposited horizontally in Spirit Lake, and they rubbed each other there, and the bark fell down, and that's how they th we think coal formed with, under pressure and heat. But that's another story. But Many of these uh, trees had tree trunks uh, still attached to them with dirt and they become waterlogged and soaked and they ended up depositing in a vertical fashion. You know, not too many, but enough. Um, actually several hundred. And so that could explain this uh, phenomenon that we see the, of this polystrate fossil. And in fact, in Colorado, um, there's also uh, a park, um, I forget the name of the park, but it's, there's a known place there called Specimen Ridge, and it's a hillside where various tree trunks uh, fossilized have been deposited, uh, estimated to be 27 different forests, and it was used as an example of evolution on the plaque there. But uh, a scientist got permission and went and uh, did some core samples of these, these trees and found, guess what? They all had the same ring structure. They were all living at the same time. They were not 27 separate forests separated in time. So they had to remove the plaque saying this is an, an example of, of evolution. Specimen Ridge in Colorado. Um, let's see here. Okay, dinosaurs. So one thing interesting about dinosaurs is people say, well, weren't they alive, you know, millions and millions of years ago? Well, you know, I already don't believe that. There's another problem that the Bible has with that, is that the, if these dinosaurs lived and died before man, but the Bible says that death didn't come into the world until man sinned. So how did these, these dinosaurs die and there was death before man sinned? Well, that's a direct contradiction to the Bible. You know, once again, I go back to the Bible. You need to look at all the prophecies that have come true. They're just impossible to come true for somebody to just guess out of nowhere uh, in God's Word that, that He says this is going to happen and then that happened. Um, it's just, you know, you can't come up with this stuff. You can't, you, can't, you can't imagine it. You know, God's Word is true. And these dinosaurs were alive when man was alive. And I believe Noah took these dinosaurs on board the ark with him. And he, he wouldn't take the large dinosaurs, he would take the small baby ones. Um, that's that's kind of common sense. And they were around. There's plenty of uh, legends of fire-breathing dragons. I don't think they're necessarily legends. Enough, enough cultures have legends of these fire-breathing dragons. It's probably, and the Bible talks about the fire-breathing dragon too. Um, I forget whether it's Behemoth or Leviathan. Um, but there's, there's three different dinosaurs that are mentioned in the Bible. And just go to the chapter of Job and, and read through Job. You'll, you'll see that there. So for fossils to form, uh, they have to be immersed in, into mud rapidly. And uh, over the process of time, uh, water will come into to that ground and minerals in the water will displace the bone material and they'll become fossilized. That's how fossils form. You don't see them forming today because when an animal dies or a plant dies on the, on the surface, 
It's eroded. It decays. Um, and there is no fossil formation today. Rel, rel, you know, we don't see it. Um, so there's a problem there. We see uh, deposits of plants, mainly sea creatures in the fossil record, but plants, animals, um, in large-scale uh, deposits around the, the earth. And the same is with coal. There's large coal seam. The, these are evidences of a global catastrophic flood. You know, they're on, they're, you can only explain these logically by the, the global catastrophic flood. So, in the fossil record, uh, we should expect to see transitional life forms. We should expect to see, you know, if, if a whale turned into a cow, we should expect to see some intermediate life forms. Um, and on and on, you know, all these different life forms that we see should be always in transition. In fact, most of the five fossils we, that we would find would be in transition. But there's problems with transitional life forms. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be compatible to their environment in most cases because, you know, if they grow appendages or grow, grow things that aren't, that aren't designed to operate in the environment, they're going to be food for another creature that's going to take advantage of that. We see uh, so-called living fossils today that haven't changed from the fossil record. So we see like the platypus, we see uh, the uh, nautilus, a certain type of nautilus, many bacteria, uh, freshwater stingrays, uh, the pelican, trilobites, um, and many more um, examples of so-called living fossils that are living today but yet are in the fossil record and guess what, they're unchanged. Now, there is a thing called variation within a species. So when you talk about animals and creatures, there are kinds and there are varieties. So one kind does not change into another kind. A cat kind does not change into a dog kind. But a dog kind, uh, being the best example, can change into many varieties, a hundred varieties of dog. Um, but if you breed out certain things in the dog, you, that, that poodle, you can't breed him back to be a German Shepherd. He's bred out. A lot of the, that genetic potential is bred out. You have to go back to the, the original dog, which they theorize was maybe a dingo, something like that. Then from that dog, you can create any type of dog you want over a process of time through selective breeding. But that dog will always be a canine. He'll, he'll never be, never be uh, a cat. So, uh, let's go to the flagellum motor. This is a big problem for evolutionists. And, and you can go search the web and you'll find that there's a lot of refutation to what I'm saying. I'm not saying that, that, that evolutionists have no answer. But what makes the most common sense here? You know, let's get real, you know. Do your own investigation and, and you might get a chuckle out of some, some of the things, some of the explanations that they've come up with for this stuff. The flagellar uh, motor or the flagellum, is a whip tail on the back of uh, a lot of bacteria that helps it to propel through liquids. This, this motor, um, it has uh, parts that are uh, analogous to regular motors today. They'll have a commutator, a stator, a rotor, uh, various gaskets, um, O-rings, and so forth. And they can whip through, uh, they can, this, this tail can turn 100,000 revolutions per minute, 100,000 RPM, and stop in a quarter turn. It's an amazing, amazing thing. What's really amazing about it is that they have, depending on the bacteria, they'll have from 30 to 40 irreducibly complex components, which cannot be broken down any further or they, or they will lose function. And 20 to 30 of these components are found nowhere else in nature. So where, where's the precursor parts to this flagellar motor? Where'd they come from? There is, no, there is no, oh, it came from over here, this part came from here, this part came from there. No. And they all, 30 or 40 parts have to be all together in, in proper order and be nourished by the bacteria in order to function. I mean, it's just impossible for evolution to explain that. It's ridiculous. It's crazy. Okay, now to carbon-14. I hope you're not too bored with this, but we'll see. C14 
has a half-life 5,700 years, give or take uh, a few years. It's known only to form in the upper atmosphere when cosmic rays or high-energy particles bombard nitrogen with a neutron and, and bounce off a proton and the carbon, uh, the nitrogen becomes carbon-14. And actually, uh, carbon-13 is actually a, a stable isotope and it's more common. Carbon-14 being radioactive decays. It has a half-life of 5,700 years. So half of that carbon-14 is gone after 5,700 years and so forth. So it's only formed in the upper atmosphere. And yet, uh, geologists have, done, have uh, taken deep cores below the Earth's crust, way down, and taken up diamonds and found traces of carbon-14 there. Now, carbon-14, as I read, I was astounded that one site I read said there's only like one or two atoms of carbon-14 in a trillion atoms of carbon. And you know diamonds are made of, of carbon. So there's, car there's carbon-14 in these diamonds that are below the Earth's surface where, car where carbon-14 can't get into the diamond. And yet uh, no, there should be no measurable trace of any carbon-14 in that diamond, certainly after 10 half-lives. So 10 times 5,700 years. About 60,000 years, there should be absolutely no trace of any carbon-14 in that diamond period. How do, you, how do you explain that? It can't be explained. It's a recent creation. Um, there's another problem with, with some of the radioactive decay that I mentioned earlier. Radioactive elements, when they decay, they release uh, subatomic particles, they release photons of light, uh, all types of uh, other elements they're released through their decay chain process and one of the most common things that's released is helium so deep in the earth's crust radioactive materials are decaying releasing releasing helium now helium is the second lightest element on the earth outside of hydrogen so the helium would disperse out of these minerals they know it doesn't stay in the minerals it actually will uh, exit these minerals over time which they've proven and yet we find that in uh, rocks, uh, zircon rocks, crystals containing uranium, that 50% of the helium that could ever have been created is still in the zircon. Why hasn't it released? Because it's been created recently. You know, it's pretty obvious. The other thing is, is if, if the uh, helium is released, we should see uh, a whole bunch more helium in the atmosphere. Now, uh, certainly uh, a portion of the helium will escape Earth's gravitational pull and that's accounted for. But uh, the amount of helium in the Earth's atmosphere uh, is estimated to uh, represent about 1.8 million years of helium going into the Earth's atmosphere. However, that does not include the great amount of helium that would have been released from Noah's flood causing a whole bunch of helium to be released that when we, you know, can make that number look like 1.8 million years, whatever. We don't know how much helium was in the original atmosphere. I'm probably not explaining this very well, but anyway, at any rate, there should be 1,000 times more helium in the Earth's atmosphere than what is observed. That's the bottom line, and you can research that. Um, bent rock layers, this is one of my favorite ones. Okay, the, the Grand Canyon is about 273 miles long, runs east to west. Um, it was basically, I believe, carved by a massive mud flow. Um, there was an area postulated to be uh, as large as, as the Great Lakes, were Great Lakes in northern uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, that broke forth after the flood, and this mud scoured out the Grand Canyon forming it very rapidly and it formed the Colorado River, not the other way around. The Colorado River did not form the Grand Canyon. The whole area is in an upthrust zone. It's, it's lifted up, it's elevated. Um, but on the western side, probably about 100 miles from the visitor center or so, on the western side of the Grand Canyon, there's a very interesting rock formation where the strata, the so-called layers, are curved and bent now, 
scientists are a little bit lost to explain how these layers, if they're thousands or millions of years old, how could they have bent in this fashion and not be fragmented into myriads of pieces? Well, obviously these layers uh, were, were all bent when they were all soft and deformable. You know, maybe uh, there was a, a, a volcanic bulge, some type of bulge underneath there. Uh, uh, tectonic plate movement could have pushed up these, these strata because you can tell these, these layers are all, all connected and yet they're not broken into pieces. So, that, you know, it's obvious that these layers uh, were all formed at relatively the same time when everything was soft. And I don't think they would remain soft for thousands and millions of years. You know, it just doesn't make sense. So this is a very, very powerful argument for a young, very young Grand Canyon. Okay, here's another one. Um, the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field is pretty interesting. It has a, a half-life of 14, only 1,400 years. That's very short, extremely short on the cosmic time scale. You know, we're in a world of hurt here. You know, instead of global, global climate change or whatever you want to call it, you know, we should be concerned about the Earth's magnetic field because that's protecting us from radiation from the sun and cosmic rays from space. And, uh, you know, if the magnetic field were to go, we'd, we'd be in a world of hurt. And if its uh, strength is decreasing by half every 1,400 years, that's, that's very serious. Uh, but that's what it's measured at. And if we go back in time, it's going to double 1,400 years ago and double and double and double so that back in the time of of Noah, it would have been about eight times stronger. And maybe before the flood, maybe 16 times stronger. And maybe uh, that super strong magnetic field back then uh, protected the Earth from all the radiation from the sun. No cosmic rays are getting in, no ultraviolet radiation, no harmful rays because there's also, the Bible uh, infers, a canopy above the Earth, which was, would have prevented ultraviolet radiation. And uh, the canopy would also uh, postulated to compress the Earth's atmosphere, making it a uh, greater atmospheric pressure around the planet. And so it's very theoretical that people could live very long lifespans um, because they wouldn't have any harmful outside influences uh, coming into their, hitting, hitting their bodies or the food would, be, would have been pure back then, obviously. They don't, wouldn't have all the chemicals in it that we have today. Um, so it's Pretty obvious to me that man could have lived a very long time time frame, and plants grew very large before the flood. You know, ca cattails that were 70 feet long. You know, uh, dragonfly dragonflies that had six foot wingspan, armadillos that were the size of VWs. You know, things were were happy back then. They grew and grew and grew. And dinosaurs, uh, like like lizards, they never stopped growing. They just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until they die. They never stop growing. So. Also, the energy field associated with that has a half-life of 700 years, so that's even, that's pretty serious too. So, a little bit about um, increase in atmospheric pressure. You know, today we have hyperbaric oxygen chambers. They're very effective at healing. People go into them every day for various reasons. I, I went into, I've been into several for my cancer because they provide extra oxygen to the body. And they've been found especially helpful for people who have carbon monoxide poisoning. It'll flush the carbon monoxide out. It'll clear the body of that. It'll clear the body of, uh, it'll help heal uh, burn victims. They're hyperbaric facilities that specialize in burn victims. Um, and they will go and they will, their, their tissue will heal far faster uh, with the extra supplied oxygen and pressure. Um, also, broken bones and any type of injury will heal much faster uh, under hyperbaric oxygen conditions. So, you know, there, you know, conditions can be made a lot better for man to survive. And I look forward to the thousand year millennial reign. I think, I think that when the, and the Bible talks about the rivers and the oceans uh, evaporating and drying up, I think there's there's a good potential that there's going to be a resurrection of that canopy. We'll maybe get to see kind of what it was like before the flood and 
And as Isaiah, when it talks about somebody dying at 100 years old, they'll be considered a child. You know, we're going we're, we're gonna to see people live to be 900 years again in the millennial reign, and it's going to be because God's going to change those conditions on the earth. I'm not going to be surprised. So there, in conclusion, there are many scientific reasons to support a recent creation. Now, we can't use the scientific method of observation and repeatability to test whether evolution or creation uh, is the real truth because we can't go back 6,000 years in time to do that. So we have to, to use what we see today. <clears throat> so what we need is an honest debate uh, between creationists and evolutionists um, and an honest, ongoing uh, discussion. And I don't believe evolution should be even really called a theory because there should be some support behind it, which well, I don't think there is. So to see it excluded from schools, oh, that's religion. And, no, that's not religion. We're talking science here. We're talking facts, things that we can see today that explain what happened in the past. So I think there should be an honest, open debate. Evolution should be taught, you know, with creation, at least at a minimum. Because right now we're teach, all we're teaching these kids is evolution. And, you know, they have no future to look forward to. No wonder they're committing suicide. No wonder they're, they're messed up. What, what's their hope? They have no hope. You know, they come from, from dust. They go to dust. They're, they're taught moral relativism and a bunch of other things. I won't go into here. But it's wrong. They need to be taught. There are, there are, other, there are answers out there. So I recommend do your own research. Do your own research. It's your soul. Your soul depends on it. Thanks.